Welcome, everybody. Um, I know this is the last session uh, today, uh, well, the last of the tracks. And I'm actually very excited to see so many people here. Uh, when I saw that this is a, I'm so late on, on the third day of a completely packed program, I thought I'm going to have maybe like 10 people here. And then I saw I'm going to go against Dr. Nick talking about Conquer, so I thought I'm going to have three people here. Uh, I'm, I'm very delighted to actually see such a big audience here. Uh, my name is Johannes. I'm uh, software engineer for Pivotal. I've been working on Cloud Foundry for the last uh, three years. Uh, always been working on the logging and metrics team, uh, early on the Loggator team. I'm very passionate about metrics and logging. Um, whenever I say that, it sounds really weird and awkward. Uh, I would not recommend using that, that as a pickup line. Um, <laughs> but it's certainly something that, that I, I grew very accustomed to working on, and uh, this is where they want to advance the product in. So uh, naturally, uh, when, the, uh, when the call for papers came along, I thought I'd, I would want to talk about uh, application performance monitoring in Cloud Foundry. Um, in order to make my title very buzzword compliant, I thought I'd call it application performance monitoring in the cloud native age, which uh, leads me to the first point. What does it actually mean to be cloud native? I took a tiny little survey, asked three people if they could give me a good definition about what it means to be cloud native. Uh, uh, one of them was able to talk intelligently about it, so uh, there's not, um, I, I found there's not a lot of information around there. So I thought, how about I actually define it? But before I go ahead and define it, I, um, I want to share this one tweet that I saw um, yesterday by one of my coworkers, Utaku. Um, if you are participating in this game, uh, now would be a really good time uh, to, to have a drink. Um, <laughs> I just yeah, uh, want to make sure that uh, I'm going to mention uh, Cloud Native a few times now, so uh, keep your hip flask out. Uh, so Cloud Native, when I, uh, when I actually looked it up, I came across uh, this definition here. Um, it means you should, your application deployment should be container packaged, it should be dynamically managed, and microservice oriented. Now, all of these three things have some implication on what that means for, uh, for monitoring. Uh, for example, the dynamically managed means your app uh, is going to be managed by a platform. Uh, if your app is crashing, you might get restarted. So do you want to get alerted in the middle of the night whenever your container is restarting? Maybe, maybe not, because the platform is going to take care of for you. You really want to make sure that you get alerted when there's customer impact, but that is, does not necessarily mean anymore when your app is crashing. So whenever I approach a topic, like application performance monitoring, I always try to approach it with those three very important questions, why and what and how. Um, so this is kind of how I, I structured my talk. Um, so the first, why do we want to monitor? I, you all are here, so I assume this is, should be very, very simple. Um, but I, I want to share this one anecdote, which I think is actually uh, so, so telling, and it should be the reason why we're all here. Who remembers the Knight Capital Group? It was just four years ago. It's, uh, I think, known as the software bug that caused the most amount of money. The Knight Cavalier Group 2012 was uh, really big in the stock trading market. Um, and they did really well. And uh, they had a very intelligent system. And so then 2012, August 1st, they deployed a new version of their software. Uh, 45, minutes later, they were out of, uh, 45 minutes later, they were out of business. Um, this is kind of what happened here. Um, they lost, uh, in 45 minutes, they were running this bad code. And they lost $400 million. Uh, and then they were acquired for a cheap bargain um, three months later by another company. They didn't recover from this. Uh, the code that was in there just uh, made the system buy a stock way overpriced. And so they lost so much money that they couldn't recover. The one thing that I find very interesting about this and how I think this is very related to our topic here, I, I mean, as a software engineer, I have pushed out bugs. I've pushed out bad code. Um, so that shouldn't be that interesting here. But they had this code run in a production system for 45 minutes until it was way too late. If they had good monitoring in place, like why didn't they catch that after five minutes or 10 minutes? They might have been able to recover from that. But they had it run until it was too late. And uh, I think this is like the one lesson that Yes, please, actually, make, let's make sure that, that we have good monitoring in place so that our company doesn't go out of business. Uh, and then the other reason uh, why I think monitoring is very important, um, sharing a little bit of a personal uh, anecdote here. I, when I 
just fresh out of college, I joined this startup uh, where I was one of the two engineers. Um, our monitoring in a learning system typically um, looked like this. Uh, customer couldn't reach our system. Customer called the CEO, and CEO called me. Um, there was, it made a very unhappy customer, made a very unhappy CEO, and uh, my wife wasn't very happy either because those calls were typically in the middle of the night. Um, so this kind of like was me back then. Um, I was like, when I could sleep, I actually tried to get sleep in uh, because I was on call 24 seven and uh, my customers called me, please let's try to not be these people. Like, I, I don't want to worry too much about my sleep. I want to have monitoring in place that allows me to sleep quietly and sound at night. Um, so these are, I think, some, some of the, the reasons why we monitor. Let's try to get good sleep as engineers and also let's make sure that our company stays in business. Um, now, next, what do we monitor? And uh, this is, I think, a topic where I might have to disappoint you because unfortunately I do not have a silver bullet here for you. Um, what we have to monitor really depends so much on what kind of application you have. In most cases, yes, it might be that latency is exactly what you want to look at. Um, latency has a huge impact on user satisfaction. Um, in other cases, you might want to look at um, your error rate or um, some completely other metric. But it depends really on what kind of app you have. And this is, I think, where it depends is such an unsatisfactory answer here. Um, but so let's actually look at some of these uh, metrics you might want to look at. So for example, there's latency. I, uh, Mike Villinger from Dynatrace mentioned this in his lightning talk uh, yesterday in the morning. Uh, when Amazon's latency drops by 100 milliseconds, they're losing 1% of their uh, conversion rate. Uh, so that's probably a metric they should watch. Um, so if I had a, a website that's basically a, a storefront, I probably would watch my latency. Um, if you have a marketing website out there and you want to encourage your uh, customers to download marketing material, the bounce rate is very important. So maybe that's what you want to monitor. If you have a batch processing system that is uh, processing satellite images, maybe you just want to look at error rate or your queue length. Um, but nevertheless, I, th I think the one thing that is um, very important, remember the business value of your app. Uh, your apps are out there not for technical reasons. I mean, latency and, and bounce rate and errors, they, those are all really great metrics to watch, but your, your app should generate business value, and you should actually keep a handle on understanding what's the business value of my app, and you should watch that very closely, because in the end, that's why you have your app deployed somewhere in a production environment. Um, so the, the uh, chunk of my talk is going to be actually spent on how do we, mon how do we monitor. Um, and so there, uh, there are a few, a few topics that I want to mention. So as I said in the beginning, being cloud native means microservice oriented. Microservice oriented means you have a request come to the first server, the first server is going to uh, fire requests to all your other microservices. Now, if the end user complains that the request is taking too long for him, you at first don't know which, exactly, which service exactly is, is taking so long. Uh, and it'll be your responsibility to figure out which service has to be tuned or which service is faulty, or which service is responsible for, uh, for um, having a negative impact on the user's interaction. And this is where request tracing comes in. When we talk about request tracing, the first thing that always comes to mind is, is uh, Sipkin. Uh, Sipkin is this project that got started by Twitter, um, actually uh, was built upon a research paper published by Google um, about a system called Dapper that does exactly that in a microservice architecture. You look at all your nodes and you see exactly where your uh, latency is, is generated. Um, so here's a very simple example um, on how to do request tracing in, uh, with, with a Cloud Foundry app. Um, imagine you push a Spring Boot app. Uh, with Spring Boot, it's very simple to enable um, the uh, Spring Sleuth project, which is a, a um, includes open Sipkin, uh, that library. Uh, you just have to put the library, the, the Sleuth library in your class path, and you're going to get this all for free. So imagine that we have um, this microservice architecture with the four services. The visualization, the visualization that you're going to get like looks like this here, where you have your first request going to service one, service one is firing your request to service two, which fires requests to service three and four, and you see exactly where is my bulk of, uh, of the latency generated. 
in, when we talk about request tracing, there's typically what we call a trace, which is the one overarching request, and then there are spans. Span is uh, that unit of work that is used by a server to actually process a request. Uh, so in this case, we have exactly seven spans uh, for, for our one trace, um, because that is uh, the service generating uh, requests to other services and processing those requests. Um, I do have a live demo, but honestly, that live demo is not that much more interesting than, than the screenshots. Um, this is an app running on Cloud Foundry. On, if you look at the URL, this is actually deployed to Pivotal Web Services. Um, it is the example straight from the uh, Spring um, Sleuth documentation. And so I um, can just generate a request to my service one here um, and can search for my request. And service one, there's my search button. There, find traces uh, and you'll see, you'll see traces. Let's go for first, and so this is a trace that we just generated uh, where you can then dial in, uh, look in, in all the details that, that you see here. Um, so if you have a microservice architecture, this is a very powerful tool. This tells you exactly what service has to be tuned, what service has uh, bad performance. So you can actually really uh, zoom in on, on the one thing that, that you have to improve. Um, so microservice architecture, please use something like this that allows you to do request tracing. And again, Spring Boot and, um, and Cloud Foundry are really your friends here because they make this in really, really easy to get this all up and running. Uh, next one, one of the very obvious choices, you have an application pushed onto Cloud Foundry. Uh, you, you have to monitor it. There are really, really good monitoring solutions out there. Uh, it's very simple to bind one of their services and restage your app and you will get uh, out of the box, a good interface to actually monitor your app. The three that I, I want to mention here, because they are actually part of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, Dynatrace, uh, New Relic, and App Dynamics. Um, I was going to try to, to look for representatives, uh, representatives for, uh, uh, from those three companies and then wanted to see who's giving the most swag, uh, so, and then I would use them as a, a demo here. Uh, but uh, nobody gave me any swag. Um, so I, I just I ended up using New Relic because honestly that was for me by far the easiest to actually uh, set up. Uh, it took it took literally a minute. I just went to Pivotal Web Services. I created a New Relic service. I bound the New Relic service to my Spring Music app, and the result looks like this here. And again, just a tiny little. Uh, where where is it? Here's my mouse. Um, this is then what I what I got as a result. Uh, just very simple to provision and, uh, and out of the box I, I get this new relic service now uh, that allows me to really drill into uh, call, uh, call traces and, and see where exactly my application source code, my application is lower. Um, even if you're not on Pivotal Web Services, I, uh, IBM Bluemix has a very similar um, service that comes out of the boxes. I think it's called something like Monana, something that allows you to monitor your uh, applications. Uh, we from Pivotal, actually the team that I'm working on, we're uh, working on, on a solution for uh, monitoring your apps that comes out of the box. So if you are on Pivotal Web Services, you can very simply go from the application manager to just click that link uh, to look at the metrics uh, of your app. Um, you will see very basic information about network traffic on your app and um, CPU and memory and disk statistics, but that all comes out of the box. So um, the Cloud Foundry ecosystem is certainly working on, on trying to make um, all these things much, much easier for you. So uh, if you, for some reason, cannot use one of these out-of-the-box um, monitoring services, New Relic and AppDynamics and Dynatrace, they all come with downsides. Maybe you don't want to push your monitoring data uh, through your firewall to a public server. Or maybe you don't want to pay for an on-prem installation. There's still so much data generated just inside the Cloud Foundry system that you can build a very comprehensive monitoring solution with, I want to say, very little overhead yourself. Um, and so I want to, over the next few minutes, I want to highlight some of the things that you can do right now without actually 
um, paying any of these monitoring services. Uh, and so it, one of the things that I um, actually worked uh, with David Sabetti uh, during a hack day a year ago, um, we were actually looking at the log output generated by an app. Um, we wanted to see if, like, if you just look at the, at the rate of log lines generated from your app, can you actually get some information out of that? And I want to say typically yes. If there's an, an anomaly in, in your app going on, you probably will see something happening with your log lines. Uh, there could be, uh, maybe it's uh, just the sheer output of logs uh, that are generated, but also what is the uh, ratio between uh, logs written to standard out and standard error? What happens if I see suddenly much more standard error output? Maybe something is wrong with my app. And so uh, David and I, we were working on a CLI plugin that I want to uh, demo here. It is very, very simplistic and doesn't look all that great. But I want to show it anyways because I want to show you how easy it is to, uh, to create um, something that is of value, can be of value. And so the CLI plugin, we called it Logalizer. Can I enter? So if I start this CLI plugin, I give it my application name, and now it's just starting a web server. Uh, and I'm going to, on that web server, let's see if I find it. Here, I'm just refreshing this, um, this page. And because my app has no log output at all yet, my logalizer analyzes automatically and tries to make a judgment call saying, yeah, something is not right here. There's no log output at all. So let's try to generate some log output. And I'm actually going to do this by hitting the application that is hosting my slides, because that's my demo. And oh, suddenly I see logs coming in. And all looks good, because all the logs that are coming in are just going to stand it out. So this is in, uh, so down here you, you would see the ratio between standard out and standard error. My app is not producing any standard error, so all is good. Um, but I, I wanted to show this to you, that this is something that, that we packed together in four hours. It, 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 just using the CLI plugin architecture, big shout out to the CLI team. Writing CLI plugins is so easy. Um, so please give it a try. Uh, this, like writing, writing a dashboard like this that you then can put up on your, on your build monitor, shouldn't take all that long. Uh, and down here is a bonus, you actually see all the log lines. Um, so this is what you can do to just monitor current log output. Um, and again, the, all the credit goes to David Sabetti, I, who actually did most of the work. Um, the next, I want to talk about latency. Uh, and again, I want to show you a uh, CLI plugin that I actually wrote this morning and took maybe all of 10 minutes to actually get that together because I mostly copy and pasted code from another CLI plugin. Um, a good developer, a lazy developer, right? Um, so uh, latency, when it comes to latency, if you don't wanna use any of these very um, great monitoring solutions like AppDynamics or Dynatrace or um, New Relic, you can still monitor latency because you get all the data delivered to you from the Cloud Foundry system. And so the one thing that I want to show here is, again, my uh, CLI plugin, which I think I have in this window. Um, I called it the app nozzle. The app nozzle, what the app nozzle plugin is doing, it's actually, it is uh, attaching to the firehose, but it's only looking for uh, messages coming for a specific app that I pa pass in. Uh, the f on this first question here, it asked me, what kind of messages are you interested in? I'm interested in latency. So I'm going to look at HTTP start stop, which is number four, is it right? right? HTTP number four. I can increase the font, yes. And so what you see here, I, I don't see anything right now because there's no request hitting my app. So let's, again, generate some traffic by just going to my slides and refreshing them a few times. And in the back, you see, you see all these uh, HTTP start stop messages coming in. So for every request to my app, I'm going to see now an HTTP start stop. Just refreshing this page once would have triggered roughly 20 requests because of all the images in, in the talk and the CSS and JavaScript. Um, but so most importantly, the one data that we really need to get out of here is there's a start time and a stop time. Um, those, obviously, the, given the difference of those two, you can see actually how long it took to see that request. Um, the one thing that I want to mention in this, uh, in this regard now is when we talk about latency, just as a general tip, um, 
a lot of people are looking at percentiles. They want to see, oh, what's the 95th percentile from application? What's my, uh, what's, uh, and given that number, they are trying to get a good uh, judgment call on uh, what's the user experience like right now. Please be very careful with percentiles. They might not actually mean what you think they mean. Um, like if for this very simple example already, I can show you one request to my application triggers 20 requests. Uh, now, if I if I don't really know what I'm doing, I might look at the 95th percentile. But given that there are 20 requests fired to my app, uh, it could very well be that um, the one main request that's actually loading all the, the content of the slides, all the text, is the one request that is uh, taking the longest. The 95th percentile might look totally good because it's just fetching cached images and cached um, JavaScript and cached CSS. That one uh, request uh, that, that actually fetches content might take way longer. And this is where percentiles can be very tricky. If you load Yahoo's front page, you're triggering, I think, 100 requests, 100 HTTP requests. So I think at that point, any user would have, I want to I think, a 15% ch chance to be in, in the top five slowest requests uh, um, rate because there might be one request, one of those 100 requests might just be very slow. So percentiles are hard. Uh, you really have to be very careful about using percentiles to, to know what the user experience is like. Uh, so be careful when you use them. Uh, the uh, few other things that I've, I wanted to mention, um, I, I, I'm a Java developer and a Go developer, so how to actually monitor and debug a Java and Go app that's running Cloud Foundry. Uh, with Java, the, the really cool thing that is possible now that I don't think is as widely advertised as it should be, uh, now that we can all SSH into containers, you actually can access uh, the JMX endpoints uh, in your Java app that's running on Cloud Foundry. Uh, and so. Actually, I don't want to take the credit here. Uh, Matthew Sykes uh, wrote this up in a very nice blog post uh, where he like, really dug in to see how, this, how we can get this to work. Um, it is now actually quite simple. So you just uh, add these environment variables to your, to your Java app that's running on Cloud Foundry. Uh, and then once you have that running, you start an SSH tunnel through the CFSSH command. Uh, you start the SSH tunnel, and so then Afterwards, you can access your JMX endpoints on port 5000 on localhost. Uh, so this is something that is very, very useful if you actually want to, um, to monitor your Java applications that, that are running Cloud Foundry because most of those monitoring solutions have a connector to JMX. And so you can easily uh, forward then the JMX information to your monitoring solution. There is one interesting caveat here. Uh, obviously, if your Java app is uh, split across multiple instances, how do you exactly know which is instance is coming from? Cloud Foundry is covered. The SSH command allows you to specify which instance you want to SSH to. And so you can actually do exactly, exactly what you have to do here. Uh, just by, if you have 10 instances, you just have to start 10 SSH tunnels. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, not that there's much value in it, but then you get a very nice check console picture, and it shows you exactly all the things that are happening in your Java container. Uh, so this is something that, that a lot of people have been asking for for the last few years, and now it's actually really simple and easy to do. Uh, this very similar, uh, you can do something for Go apps. Uh, I've been using Go for the last three years, so that's certainly where like, my passion is. Uh, that's my speed spot. Uh, with Go, you can very simply enable the, the, P, uh, the P profiling endpoints uh, by just importing uh, one package from, from the Go libraries, from the Go standard library. And so once you have that imported, Go will try to uh, make all these profiling information available to the user. Uh, it actually was a little bit tricky to get this to work. Um, I have a, um, on, on my GitHub, uh, there's a, um, an application called pprof on CF. You can just go there and uh, look at the source code, what you, and so you can just see what you have to do to, to get it to work. Um, just to show you what the information looks like that you can get out of it, we can look at the example that I have up. So this is uh, like very simply, those, those are the endpoints you get. You get information about your, your threats, your Go routines, your garbage collection. All these things are available for any of your Go apps by just uh, enabling um, the pprof libraries. Here you have, again, the interesting problem is what happens if you have multiple instances for your application. Um, the one thing that there are some creative ways to deal with this, uh, one would be using sticky sessions with, uh, with uh, JSession ID. So there, there, there are ways to actually 
make sure that you can get access to information for any for every container. The um, there are only two more things that I want to mention. Uh, one is uh, very very dear to me, and is if this is the only thing that you retain from this talk, then I'm happy. Uh, please make sure that you monitor in all the environments, not just in your production environment. Monitor in your dev environment, in your test environment. Again, I have to quote what Mike uh, Vininger said from, from Dynatrace, because I thought that was actually a, a very, very cool quote. Um, and I don't think I get the quote exactly right, but he said something like, um, this new world is not about just pushing out bad code faster through automation and pipelines. Um, so you really wanna make sure that the code that you're writing is good and you can do this by having good monitoring in place for your development and your test environment. Um, so that you know that before you push to prod, your development and your test environment looks all good. Uh, Cloud Foundry is actually doing that, I think, really well by, uh, by monitoring on all stages of the pipeline and there's good monitoring in place. The same monitoring that's in place for uh, the production environments uh, for Pivotal Web Services is in place for, uh, for the, the stages in the pipeline before it hits Pivotal Web Services. And so I, uh, I, I really like, like the way how, how we do it there. And I can encourage you to just do the same. And then uh, once you have this all in place, uh, your, your really good monitoring system, make sure you use that in the right way by having alerts uh, set up correctly. Um, there's a, a project that I work on right now uh, that's all about alerting uh, that'll be available uh, for Pivotal Web Services and, and Pivotal Cloud Foundry um, soonish. Uh, the very interesting thing about alerting um, that I, I want to mention here is um, when, when you set up your alerts, m make sure that you look for anomalies. And uh, looking anomal anomal anomaly detection is not very easy. Uh, it's actually really difficult to figure out what your anomalies might be like. Is it because you might have a spike every Monday morning between uh, eight and noon because your app is getting more requests during the time. Or you might have a spike every Christmas time because you're in the business of selling Christmas decorations. Or you're in the uh, tax industry and, and every tax day, uh, the week before the taxes, you might get um, a big spike. And so you, you really wanna make sure that you are anticipating those anomalies and they, they are not necessarily triggering your alerting system. Um, besides that, I think um, those are all the things that I wanted to share. Uh, just one last uh, favor that I have to ask you. Uh, if you are at all interested in having your application emit custom metrics uh, through the Lockergator pipeline, uh, please let Jim Campbell know, the product owner of the Lockergator team. Um, he's here somewhere. Uh, and with that, uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I really appreciate you all being here. Are there any questions? Yep. Uh, how hard is it to get uh, Zipkin within the platform itself, like being able to create requests within the platform and what proposals within the platform are slow? Within the platform itself, uh, it would be interest so you mean the Cloud Foundry platform, that would be uh, certainly absolutely possible because there are very nice Go libraries and most of the components are written in Go. They're very nice Go libraries uh, for, for Zipkin. Um, so I don't think it would be a lot. It's just, I think the orchestration effort is going to be uh, huge because you have to make sure that all these teams are working on this streamlined effort to get um, all their components instrumented so that they emit logs, uh, the, the, the logs that Zipkin is expecting. Uh, to the Sipkin server. Uh, so I don't think it would be all that hard, but it's just orchestration. No other questions? Thank you.